Welcome to part two of Primary Rehabilitation for South Asian Communities in UK. In part one video, I discuss what are the unique needs of South Asians to be considered in the design of primary rehabilitation and why it is important to address those needs. If you have not watched the part one video, I would recommend you to watch the part one video before watching this part two video. Hey folks, welcome to Long Mind channel. If you're watching me for the first time, I'm Ms. Devi Sundar, founder of Teletherapies, and I'm by professional trade a respiratory physiotherapist, counselor, psychotherapist, and health coach. In this part two video, I'm going to discuss what is the current model of pulmonary rehabilitation care in the UK and how to deliver an equitable pulmonary rehabilitation care. Without any further ado, let's dive into the video. Before I could uh, fill you with the current model of pulmonary rehabilitation in UK, I would like to throw some insights on the issue of pulmonary rehabilitation. Chronic lung disease, such as tuberculosis and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, were the major health concerns in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Sanatoriums were established in various parts of the world to treat tuberculosis patients, focusing on rest, fresh air, and good nutrition as a part of the treatment. The development of uh, antibiotics, particularly the streptomycin, in the mid-20th century revolutionized the treatment of tuberculosis, leading to a significant decline in the sanitary use. During this period, the emphasis shifted from a long-term bed rest to more active treatments such as chest physiotherapy and breathing exercises to help individuals with lung disease. And the concept of pulmonary rehabilitation as a formalized program began to emerge in 1960s. The early pioneers in this field, such as Dr. Donald F. Rochester and Dr. Thomas L. Petty, played a key role in developing the structured rehabilitation programs for patients with chronic lung disease. Pulmonary rehabilitation program in this era incorporated exercise training, education, psychosocial support to help patients manage the conditions better. In 1974, the American Thoracic Society, ATS, published a statement that acknowledged the benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation for patients with COPD. Research and clinical evidence continue to support the effectiveness of pulmonary rehabilitation in improving the exercise tolerance and overall quality of life. Pulmonary rehabilitation program began to be established in hospitals and outpatient settings, uh, catering to a broader range of respiratory conditions beyond COPD. In 1990s, professional organizations, including the American College of Chest Physicians, ACCP, and the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation, AACVPR, developed the guidelines and standards for pulmonary rehabilitation program. And these guidelines helped standardize the components of pulmonary rehabilitation, including the exercise training, education, nutritional counseling, and psychosocial support. Research into the benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation continued and evidence-based supporting pulmonary rehabilitation effectiveness grew. The European Respiratory Society, um, short form ERS, was formed in 1990 as well. And it was established to promote and advance respiratory medicine, research, advocacy, collaboration, and education in Europe. And since its um, conception, the ERS has been leading a uh, professional organization in the field of respiratory medicine, bringing together the healthcare professionals, scientists, and researchers to collaborate on respiratory health issues and contribute to improving patient care and outcomes. And the key initiatives, some of them to mention here, it was involved in research and publication, education and training, guidelines and recommendation, advocacy and awareness, collaboration and networking, conference and congresses, patient advocacy, training and certification, scientific task force, global outreach. These activities reflect ERS commitments to advance respiratory health, promoting research and education, and improving the care of individuals with respiratory disease. Over the years, ERS has played a significant role in shaping the field of respiratory medicine in Europe and beyond. Now, let's look into the definition of pulmonary rehabilitation. The definition of pulmonary rehabilitation has been evolving since its conception. And uh, I would like to throw lights on the uh, definition which has been um, brought in in 2013. Um, it is uh, ATS and ERS combined uh, definition for pulmonary rehabilitation. So I'm going to read out the definition now. So it has been defined, um, pulmonary rehabilitation, 
is a comprehensive intervention based on a thorough patient assessment followed by patient-tailored therapies that include, but are not limited to, exercise training, education, and behavior change, and designed to improve the physical and psychological condition of people with chronic respiratory disease, and to promote a long-term adherence to health-enhancing behaviors. So this is a point we noted here, which is a uh, says that pulmonary rehabilitation is a program to promote long-term adherence to health-enhancing behavior change. So many of the programs across worldwide uh, varies in the content and the delivery method, which is a key challenge in pulmonary rehabilitation at present, and that also serves as a barrier for patient recruitment and retention in the program. While many associate pulmonary rehabilitation with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it is also very essential to know that uh, people with other long-term conditions, um, lung conditions such as uh, bronchiectasis and pulmonary fibrosis can also benefit from pulmonary rehabilitation. Let's look into what is the current healthcare system in UK for pulmonary rehabilitation. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is the second most common lung disease in UK after asthma. And uh, during COVID time, England uh, was uh, recommending at least uh, 527,000 people with severe COPD to shield to reduce the risk of um, the, the COVID-19 um, to those severe COPD patients. And in 2016, Asthma and Lung UK confirmed uh, 1.2 million uh, were diagnosed with COPD. And the task force for lung health in UK confirmed uh, that 40,000 people among those diagnosed with COPD did not understand the condition. And also uh, further, 1 million people remain undiagnosed. When you look into the BTS guidelines, the standards of the content delivery, the BTS guidelines, quality guidelines, standards um, recommend the pulmonary rehabilitation program should be at least um, six weeks duration and include twice weekly supervised session. And uh, which means then um, the patients are going to get 12 sessions. And also it recommends the uh, uh, sessions are delivered in groups, eight to 16 people and conducted in a various community settings such as hospital, halls, leisure centers, and health centers. And uh, the courses are led by a trained healthcare professionals, including physiotherapists, nurses, and occupational therapists. And also the BTS guidelines recommend that um, pulmonary rehabilitation should be um, provided uh, to people who are um, going through the hospital discharge with exacerbation within 90 days of the discharge, and also uh, following the assessment of pulmonary rehabilitation within two weeks, the patient should commence the pulmonary rehabilitation program. And uh, if you're looking into all those uh, quality standards from BTS, uh, the question arises, yeah, what happens to those in the community who are in the mild, moderate stages, who are not going to be having frequent exacerbation and who are not going to be in the emergency um, department in the hospital. And also in the International Pulmonary Rehabilitation Guideline, uh, it is recommended um, patient um, who referred to pulmonary rehabilitation should have at least 20 sessions to achieve a physiological benefit or more extended programs to sustain the positive effects of the health related quality of life and behavior change. Evidence confirms at least more than 16 weeks of training is deemed appropriate to improve the aerobic fitness in healthy population. So if you're comparing that with um, people who, um, going through pulmonary rehabilitation in the present practical um, um, practical days, um, it is mostly people between the ages of 50, 60s and 80s. And um, so this is going to be requiring a uh, longer time for their body to adapt to that physiological changes um, achieved through the rehabilitation. Today, there is no consensus on the duration of the pulmonary rehabilitation or local resources or the behavioral patterns for patients with COPD or other chronic lung disease. In practice, most pulmonary rehabilitation programs in the UK have adopted a reductionist approach with a shorter programs of six weeks, two to three times per week, delivered in various settings like uh, primary, secondary and community care, positioned only around the concept of exercise training and education, missing the component of psychosocial support.
And additionally, the pulmonary rehabilitation performance indicators are focused on the functional walk test with the least attention to daily living activities or mental health. So, and also um, there is uh, no incorporation of a nutritionist um, or a psychotherapist or a counselor in the program, uh, which is also going to have a greater negative impact and not just giving the pulmonary rehabilitation to the fullest to the patients. Pulmonary rehabilitation is more than just an exercise program or a chest physiotherapy, and it warrants an, um, a multidisciplinary team, as I mentioned earlier, to improve the skills for the patients for an effective long-term behavior change in patients. Ideally, it should be a one-stop shop offering a, a comprehensive patient-tailored intervention, some medical, physical, psychological therapies, and social care support to witness that sticky long-term health enhancing behavior change. When we look into uh, the delivery methods and how the funding is handled around in UK and how many centers in pulmonary rehabilitation in UK, um, Taking the data and the facts, um, in England alone, uh, there are hundred and um, sorry, um, in England alone, there are thousand two hundred and fifty uh, primary care networks, uh, and they are based around the GPs and uh, typically serving uh, communities between uh, thirty thousand to fifty thousand people, with some flexibility. And if uh, eligible COPD sufferers had access to pulmonary rehabilitation, then the NHS England could see a reduction of 150,924 GP appointments and 26,633 fewer hospital admissions per year, according to the data released by the Task Force for Long Health. Pulmonary rehabilitation can prevent the need for additional GP appointments and hospital admission by reducing the exacerbation for people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is the second biggest um, lung condition after asthma in the UK. In my uh, paper, um, a research paper, uh, which I did a narrative review on the renewed vision on pulmonary rehabilitation service delivery for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease management beyond COVID-19, uh, published in 2021, I have mentioned on the pulmonary rehabilitation clinical audit data, um, the, uh, the clinical audit uh, for pulmonary rehabilitation conducted between the 2019 and 2020 revealed there's only 223 uh, pulmonary rehabilitation centers across UK, uh, splitting the figures in England, 194 centers, in Scotland, 18 centers of pulmonary rehabilitation centers, and in Wales, 11. Uh, for a UK population of uh, more than 66 uh, million shedding light on an uneven distribution of pulmonary rehabilitation program nationwide. Another report also confirmed there's a 14 different um, integrated care system models across the uh, England uh, are not meeting the expected reduction in hospital admissions. And the reasons are uh, given to be the lack of patient perspectives or um, low multidisciplinary work, working partnership at primary care and lack of uh, smart outcome measures. Based uh, on the recent figures um, in 2023 in NHS websites, um, the pulmonary health centers in UK have increased from 223 uh, back in 2020 to 250 centers now. But is even 250, is it enough uh, centers to handle the health concerns of um, chronic respiratory disease in UK? Um, looking at the figure, maybe taking an example, looking at the figure back in 2016 uh, released by the British Lung Foundation, uh, 1.2 million was diagnosed. Um, for example, if one centre enrolls 16 patients per week, then in 50 weeks, excluding the public holidays, per year that one centre can deliver pulmonary rehabilitation to 800 patients. So, 250 centers would offer pulmonary rehabilitation for 200,000, leaving behind that uh, 100,000 people unsupported. So we need more 125 pulmonary rehabilitation centers. So to handle the diagnosed population of 1.2 million uh, people with COPD, we need at least 375 pulmonary rehabilitation centers. 
A study by Jones um, from 2002 suggested a cost uh, um, for a person um, uh, receiving primary habitation and primary care between 200 pounds to 400 pounds. And they also found that the average should be uh, 220 pounds per patient who completed the primary habitation in the primary care. Based on that, if you calculate the rate um, for 1.2 million uh, population with diagnosed COPD, we need at least 26 million um, um, approximately uh, to deliver the pulmonary rehabilitation service. And here's a big deal. Pulmonary rehabilitation uh, intervention has been adopted as a national priority uh, by NHS long-term plan, and it reflects the commitment to improve the lives of individuals with chronic lung condition across the country. And moving forward, the ICF model um, uh, should involve the primary care networks and have a shared vision with the um, other collaborators in the community to tackle the personal, behavioral, and social care for patients with COPD. In uh, alignment with the NHS long-term plan, um, there is also other schemes like her GP contracts includes a quality outcome framework incentive for referrals and uh, transforming this funding um, into equity of access to all the people in the community is going to be a greater challenge, but uh, a, a collaborative working partnership might actually be a solution to prove this and uh, achieve the outcomes which is aimed in the NHS long-term plan. Now, to attend the question, how we can deliver the equitable pulmonary habitation care to South Asian communities in UK, the first one is the cultural competency and sensitivity training I would like to focus. Healthcare providers should undergo cultural competency and sensitive training to understand and address the specific needs and beliefs of South Asian patients. This includes understanding the cultural practices, religious beliefs, dietary preferences that might impact their healthcare decisions. And respiratory care providers, including the policymakers, should start listening to people with curiosity and compassion by being mindful that the privilege and power does not blind the ethnic specific pulmonary rehab care delivery. And language access, the second point I would like to uh, throw light on, providing access to the interpreters and uh, translators uh, to people with a uh, language barrier would improve the communication uh, with the South Asian patients. And uh, this will ensure the patient can understand their medical condition, treatment option, and follow-up instructions. And the third one is the community outreach and education. Uh, it is to engage the South Asian community uh, with the religious institution and collaborating uh, partnership with them so that the cultural events also include health education workshops. These workshops can raise awareness among the common long health issues and its impact on mental health and preventive measures and available healthcare services. And uh, representation in the healthcare staff is the fourth point I would like to mention here. Uh, hiring a healthcare professional from diverse backgrounds, um, um, including South Asian communities, can foster a sense of trust and understanding among the patient, and representation can lead to more a culturally sensitive care. And also, South Asian healthcare professional having a leading role um, in the uh, delivery and care of uh, respiratory care for the South Asian population will help to um, um, observe the information and uh, also uh, engagement from the South Asian communities in the program. So it should be a culturally specific program, um, which might actually support the engagement. And tailored healthcare promotions um, um, is the fifth point I would like to throw light on. It's about developing the health promotion initiatives that are culturally tailored and uh, consider the unique dietary lifestyle and health beliefs of South Asia. And uh, these programs can address uh, conditions like diabetes, um, heart disease, and mental health issues that might be more prevalent in this population. And the sixth one is uh, access to traditional health healing practices, like uh, as I mentioned earlier in the previous part, uh, part one of the video. Um, it is uh, very important that we acknowledge and respect the traditional healing practices in South Asian culture, and um, that might foster an open conversation about these practices and uh, to ensure a coordinated and safe health care, and so that uh, they, we can also incorporate the Western um, 
rationale of um, delivery of care uh, to those population. And health literacy programs, like uh, creating resources and materials in multiple languages that explain respiratory disease, medication use, and disease management is very important. And this empowers uh, patients to make an informed decision about their health. And um, as well, um, along the side, when you're making the health literacy program, it's very important to give, uh, to give importance to the um, language diversity um, within the South Asian population, as it is very rich and varied in South Asia. Um, South Asia is a home of numerous languages, each with its own distinct linguistic characteristics, scripts, cultural significance. Um, some of the highlights of the South Asian language is the um, uh, diversity. Uh, with hundreds of languages spoken across the region, um, there are different uh, categories like Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, Tibeto, Burman, and more. And uh, for example, in Indo-Aryan languages, um, these languages include Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, Gujarati and Marathi, and the Dravidian languages um, in South India uh, and Sri Lanka, uh, it's spoken majorly, and it includes Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, and Malayalam. And Tibeto Burman languages found in the parts of Himalayan region, and these include the Tibetan, Nepali, and Bhutanese, and uh, Sino Tibetan languages um, like uh, Manipuri and Mizo are spoken in northeastern India, which shares cultural ties with Southeast Asia. So um, Southeast Asia and South Asia as a whole use a variety of scripts and writing systems. And um, this needs to be given importance when we are actually preparing the literacy material uh, to empower a patient about their condition. And uh, in healthcare setting, language diversity can be a significant challenge and uh, patients would prefer someone who can, they can communicate in the native language so that they can understand the nuances of the healthcare, um, healthcare recommendations and how, what are the tips they need to be following. And this will give an engagement and attachment to the program, from rehabilitation program to the South Asian population. Now, cultural significance, um, again, um, South, South Asia holds a greater cultural significance and they are closely tied with literature, music, religious texts and local tradition. So you're using music that is more familiar with the population for pulmonary rehabilitation program, um, especially the exercise programs, might help them to engage better in the program. And uh, in terms of uh, culturally inclusive facilities, um, designing a healthcare facility that is um, welcoming different cultural practices like uh, providing some space for the prayer, accommodating dietary needs, displaying uh, cultural relevant art in the program area might help them to get attracted and engage and feel uh, to be as a community um, in the program. And flexibility in scheduling may also be needed uh, during the color, uh, religious events, what uh, the, those uh, South Asian populations are following. And collaborating with the community leaders is very much important, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, this is going to give, again, more of an engagement from the South Asian population. And uh, regular health screening and checkups of uh, um, um, offered to this category of uh, South Asian communities, um, help them to keep their emotional well-being, coping skills, and lung function and physical endurance, and also to attend and engage in school session programs and, and give a better prospects of engagement and uh, maintenance. And uh, looking into the whole service delivery, as the technology is growing and in the current era, it's more towards the tele-rehab. And so incorporating tele-rehabilitation and home based program uh, in a culturally sensitive way to those population was very much important to um, gain great access to and equitable access to those communities. And also, finally, uh, last but not the least, um, so reducing the stigma on mental health is very, very important. So incorporating a psychologist or a counsellor into the programme would give a greater support and uh, benefit to the patient and also to the programme. And so that we see a great engagement uh, from those population because it gives uh, the community a sense that uh, they can actually open up and communicate to their counsellors or psychotherapists or also 
can talk about the strategies, coping strategies to handle the anxiety, depression, uh, because exercise training alone or education alone is not going to support them to gain that psychological support. Um, so it is very much important to have in mind to incorporate mental health practitioners in the program and also to identify the educational needs, uh, not only in the patient, but also in among the clinicians, uh, because primary rehabilitation is still an alien term to most of the clinicians um, in primary care. So um, identifying those educational needs, uh, the commissioners of primary rehabilitation uh, should do that as a priority, um, identifying the educational needs and providing training and support to the clinicians is very much important to promote that increased referral rates of pulmonary rehabilitation and uh, patient retention and recruit. Delivering an equitable healthcare to South Asian in UK require a collaborative effort in uh, among the healthcare providers, policymakers, community leaders, and the South Asian community itself as a whole. So we need to partner with the patient by having the relevant conversation on what matters to them, involve the patient in healthcare decision making, considering their cultural preferences and personal values. This approach uh, can improve the patient satisfaction and treatment adherence. And it's also important to collect the data of South Asian based on the ethnic diversity and patient report outcomes. It helps us understand and address the unique needs of this diverse population. And the healthcare system can work towards providing a high quality patient centered care for everyone making a personalized uh, and a meaningful experience. As pulmonary rehabilitation is established as a gold standard management for patients with chronic lung disease, and the field is constantly evolving, offering hope and support to millions of people worldwide living with chronic lung disease, it's very important here in UK, we make changes to our healthcare system and delivery methods to what matters to the patients, um, I mean, the people with chronic lung disease, uh, rather than what matters to the healthcare system. We have now come to the end of the video and I'll leave you with those information. And before I could close this video, I would like to ask a favor from you. If you have found this video useful, please do hit that like and subscribe button and share with your friends and network. That means a lot to me because um, recent data from my YouTube says that over 80% of the viewers who watch my video doesn't subscribe to the channel. Please do help me out by subscribing to my channel and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. Davy Sundar.